These two wonders are the baddest Fords you can buy. They're the newest pair to spring from the mind of Steve Celine. going guys Bradley here and today I wanted to revisit the topic of the Crown Vic motor swap in your SN95 or new Edge Mustang so over on Instagram and if you don't follow me on Instagram here's the handle I posted a quick question on the story about if anybody wanted me to retouch on this topic and, and revisit it and an overwhelming amount of people said yes so there was over 120 people that responded and about 90% said yes so that's exactly what we're gonna do here and then a second question I asked was if there was any questions pertaining to the swap uh, that people had and wanted answers to. So we're also going to cover that as well. I've had tons of people send me messages on Instagram or drop a comment uh, on a picture or a reel or whatever, or leave a comment on the previous video. And most of them have been able to get to, but there's a couple I haven't and a couple that require a little bit more explanation. So the goal with this video is to be your main source of information for doing this swap if you're interested in it or you're in the middle of it right now. And one thing I'd like to add is definitely watch this video in its entirety first. And if you have any questions, definitely feel free to drop them down below if I don't answer them already. So let's go ahead and dive in. So since there's a lot of new subscribers, I just really quick want to give a rundown of what's going on here with my car. This is a 2011 Crown Victoria P71 motor. It had about 28,000 miles when I first got it. It's probably sitting at about 31 now. So it's been through its first oil change it's been on the dyno it's had the crap beat out of it i mean it's really doing good uh considering that it went from you know probably a pretty boring life to sitting for a few months to getting 12 pounds of boost jammed into it but one of the great advantages of these motors is that when you go to the junkyard or wherever to pick one of these motors up you're gonna be spending about half the cost you would be spending if you bought it from a Mustang. Um, and these motors come in the Crown Victorias, the Mercury Grand Marquis, and the Lincoln Town Cars. And if I had to bet, if you get one from a Town Car or Grand Marquis, chances are it's probably an old person who owned it, which means they probably took care of it. They probably didn't beat the crap out of it. So it's lived a pretty easy life. It's also probably a really good candidate. The Crown Vic motors, you kind of have to be wary about, especially if it was a former cop car. It's probably had a lot of idle time and it's seen uh, a lot of abuse and maybe hasn't been maintained the best. So just something to look out there for. Luckily, mine was not a cop car. Mine was just a civilian model. It just happened to be the P71 package um, and it checked out. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the differences between a Panther platform motor and a Mustang motor. So there's going to be just a few minor things, but uh, one of the big questions that gets asked is, is there anything different internally? And the simple answer to that question is no. They are the same rods, they are the same pistons, they are the same cams, and the only kind of internal difference is going to be the crank. And that all depends on if it's a Romeo or a Windsor motor. The Windsor motors are going to have eight bolt cranks. Your Romeo motors are going to have six bolt cranks. This only matters if you're going to buy a flex plate or a flywheel again, or if you're swapping or anything like that. Or if you are taking a eight bolt motor out of your car and putting a six bolt motor in, which you most likely are going to be doing. Uh, there's a way more Romeo motors out on the market than there are Windsor motors. And they're also newer. So if you get a newer Crown Vic or a Crown Marquis or Town Car motor, chances are it's going to be a six bolt. In terms of things that you have to swap, there's only six real major things that you're going to need to do. Number one is going to be your oil pan. Number two will be your oil pickup tube. Number three will be your exhaust manifolds. Number four will be your intake plenum because the Crown Vics actually go to the driver's side instead of the passenger side like on the Mustangs. Number five is going to be your motor mounts, and number six is going to be your wiring harness. So if this is your first time doing a motor swap or really diving deep into a motor like it was for me, the first two on the list are probably a little bit scary, and that's okay. They're actually not that hard to do at all. They're really simple, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you how to do that. 
So let's go ahead and start with the oil pan. Your oil pan is going to be 16 bolts. They're all the same length, so you don't have to keep them in order or anything. You'll want to go ahead and drop those out and then take the pan off as well. Now, this will be a good time to go ahead and do your oil pan gasket. It's pretty much impossible to try and change the oil pan gasket later on if you need to. And if it leaks, you're just going to hate life. So go ahead and change it now. It just makes sense to do it while you have it apart. Once you have your oil pan off, you're also going to notice that the... Mustang oil pan in comparison with the Crown Vic oil pan is smaller and you want to make sure you use the Mustang oil pan as well as the Mustang oil pickup because the Crown Vic oil pan will hit on the Mustang K member and it will not work and if you end up kind of trying to jam it in there it's going to damage it it's going to choke the motor and then it's going to kill it and then you're going to be in the same situation all over again where you could be having fun driving your car now looking at the pickup tube you're also going to notice that the Mustang pickup tube is shorter as well and it's going to have three bolts you're going to have two up on the top where it actually connects to the block and then you're going to have one which is on this little standoff looking thing it's kind of like a bracket and you'll just want to take those three off as well and then just do the this whole thing back in reverse. Now definitely make sure if you're reusing these parts from an old motor, maybe your previous motor that blew up or something like that, definitely make sure you've cleaned the parts that are going on the motor as best you can. Get any metal shavings out, any old oil sludge, any of that crap. You can clean it with brake clean. You can throw it in a parts washer if you have that available to you. The parts washer will probably get it a lot cleaner, but brake clean will probably work just fine. And once you got everything ready, go ahead and put it back together. You're going to want to torque the two bolts that go into the oil pump to nine foot pounds and then the one for the bracket to 19 foot pounds. As for the oil pan bolts, you'll want to torque those to 15 foot pounds. So now that the two hardest things are out of the way, let's move on to something easier, which is going to be the exhaust manifolds or headers. Now, if you are putting headers on, the process is going to be pretty much the same. I will say if you have long tube headers and you're trying to do the motor through the top, just like I did, have fun. It's the exact reason I decided not to do long tube headers. Shorty headers will be pretty easy to do. It's about the same as doing stock exhaust manifolds. You're going to have eight bolts for each manifold. Go ahead and take those out. Go ahead and throw your new gasket on and start bolting up your new exhaust manifolds or headers. And you'll wanna make sure they are torqued down to 15 foot pounds as well. One quick side note though, you might have to move your oil dipstick tube, either take it out or kind of finagle your header or manifold in there uh, on the driver's side, but the other side will go on just fine. Moving on to the next item on the list, let's look at the intake plenum. That's going to be four bolts that hold it down to the intake manifold. The intake manifold should not need to be changed unless you are putting a supercharger or something else on the car. For me, I didn't retain that because I had the Celine supercharger going back on, but if you're staying in A or if you're turbo or anything else, you'll probably need that. And you can leave that stock one on there. That should be just fine unless you notice that it's cracked or you have an upgraded one that doesn't have that issue with the coolant leak. Go ahead and put a new gasket on there and bolt your Mustang plenum on and your EGR if you are deciding to retain it. And you can put on your throttle body as well. Moving on, next we're going to cover your motor mounts. You'll have three bolts on the block where the motor mount connects. You'll want to go ahead and take that off, put your Mustang motor mounts on, and make sure those get torqued down to 30 foot-pounds. Now, when you go to drop the motor in the car, make sure you torque down the nuts that hold the motor mount to the camera burr to 120 foot-pounds. Now we're ready to move on to the last thing, which is going to be the wiring harness. Now, I would suggest that you put the wiring harness on after the motor is put into the car, just because it'll be a little bit easier. At least it was for me. Some other people prefer to do it first, and that's fine, but you run the risk of accidentally breaking a connector or something like that. Your wiring harness is going to be pretty much plug and play. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't ship. Your injectors and your coil packs, which are probably going to be the easiest two to get confused, only plug into their respective parts, so you don't have to worry about somehow plugging in an injector into a coil pack. It's just not possible. Everything is kind of measured out to plug into exactly where it needs to plug into. So if your connector doesn't reach to a certain spot, it might be that you're grabbing the wrong connector for the wrong place. Now, since we're on the topic of wiring harness, I know there are some people who are going to be doing this in a SN95, a pre-New Edge car. And so there are going to be a few minor differences, especially given that the Older cars use plug wires rather than using coil on plugs. You shouldn't have any issue putting a newer two valve into one of these cars. You just wanna make sure you're using your original wiring harness. That way you have your spark wires and your ignition coils as the car was designed to run with. 
So now that we've covered the six major things with doing this swap, I wanna move on to the question and answer portion of this video and answer some of the questions that you guys have asked me. The first question I want to cover is, do you have to change the oil filter housing? And that one's a little bit of a 50-50. It seems that some of these cars, it will fit. In fact, my buddy was able to keep his Crown Vic one with no issues, but I wasn't able to. I'm not entirely sure why. If it makes you feel better, just keep the one that you have. Take it off of your old motor if you have an old motor or buy a Mustang one. They're not that expensive. And go ahead and swap that on and make sure that you put the new gasket on. It's a common leak point and it was actually one of the things that contributed to the death of my original motor. Another question I've been asked a couple times is what the process is like swapping from a V6 to a 4.6. And unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of information on that process, but I know it's been extensively covered on some of the Mustang forums. So I'll link a couple good threads on how that's done below. I've also been asked if it's actually worth swapping the motor or just repairing the motor that you have. And for my motor, at least the one that I used to have in my car, it had a bad head gasket. It had a couple other issues as well. It had low compression. It was just a bunch of crap going on with that thing. And it was actually more financially smart to just replace the whole motor. That way I just knew everything was newer as well. But if you are planning on making big power, then by all means, go ahead and build yourself a new motor or rebuild the motor that you have. It, it's all depending on what you want to do with it and what your budget is. If you have an issue like a blown head gasket or you have some pretty major timing chain issues or you're knocking or ticking or whatever, in all honesty, it just makes more financial sense to replace the motor than to dig in and spend a bunch of time and money trying to repair that. These motors are so abundant, it just makes more sense to do it that way, in my opinion. And a final question I want to cover, which I really liked, was what the toughest part of this was. And for me, it was trying to stay encouraged while doing this. This was my first motor swap. It was a pretty scary experience for me at first because I had never gone into a car this deep. And just the whole thought of pulling this motor out and putting a new one in, especially when the car had just been repainted and, and a bunch of other things was just a really scary thought to me. But luckily we were able to get it done. And, and really just after starting to see things change, like, Painting the motor was the big thing for me and putting the valve covers on it was a big thing and, and just seeing the motor kind of come together was was really a good encouragement and you know it can get a little freaky with a ton of parts everywhere and you're looking at this big mess and you see no motor in your your engine bay and you're like what the heck do I do and and all this just take your time don't rush. Don't be afraid to go on YouTube go on Google search up how to do certain things if you're not sure about it. And you can never arm yourself with too much knowledge for doing this. The more information you have on doing this, the easier it's going to be. Another thing too I'd like to add is if you have friends or family that offer to help you, take them up on it. Even if it's just something as holding a flashlight or helping you tighten some stuff down, something easy if you're afraid to let them work on something highly specific, you know, that kind of stuff really helps make the rest of the process go faster. If you have more hands on deck and you can kind of just say, hey, I need help doing this or I help needing that, it's way easier to do some of these things when you have a second person or a third person to help as well, especially when it comes to putting the motor back in the car or even taking the motor out in the first place. So now hopefully that you've listened to all of this and watched through it, you kind of have a better understanding of what this swap involves and, and you'll see that it's really not that hard, at least in comparison to doing some of these other motor swaps. I mean, this is pretty much a direct swap with very minor changes. So hopefully this video helps you out if you're in the middle of it or if you're thinking about doing it. And if you have any more questions that I didn't cover or anything you'd like to add, uh, feel free to drop it down in the comments below. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and I will see you guys in the next one.